Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll give you a rundown of all the key business stories you need to know about. From Nairobi, Juba, Cairo, Lagos, you name it. If it happened, you'll hear about it right here. Here's what's coming up in the next 30 minutes. South Sudan bans all foreigners from working in the country. You'll be looking at the implications on its economy. Delegate to the World Export Development Forum discuss the need to invest in women. And we'll be talking to an entrepreneur who's reaping quite the bug from his solutions to beating Cairo's ridiculous traffic jams. Now let's start with South Sudan. The country has banned the employment of foreign workers, including those with non-governmental organizations, and it's essentially ordered their replacement by local personnel with a deadline of the 15th of October. The order, dated September 15th, orders all non-governmental organizations, privately owned banks, insurance companies, telecommunication firms, petroleum companies, hotels and lodges, to give termination notices to foreign staff that they have employed. South Sudan's Information Minister Michael Makwe, however, told AFP that it would not involve all jobs, but jobs that South Sudanese people can do. South Sudan hosts thousands of immigrant workers and businessmen from neighboring Kenya, Uganda and Ethiopia. It remains unclear, however, exactly what their fate will be in the coming month. Now then, Kofa Mrenje is alive in the South Sudanese capital of Juba. He joins us from there right now. Kofa, why exactly did Salva Kiir's government make the decision to order all foreign staff out of the country within the next four weeks? Well, Rama, the main reason that has been given here uh, is, is very simple. The government here says this is just one of the ways of uh, creating job opportunities uh, for qualified South Sudanese who are living here uh, in the country. But of course, this is something that has caught uh, many here unawares. Uh, we have uh, thousands uh, of uh, foreign investors here. We have thousands of uh, workers, uh, of foreign workers, living and, and, and working in South Sudan, and not just here in the capital, but also in other parts of the country. And therefore, for them, uh, some of them have lived here for uh, many years. And within uh, uh, one, one, one month, that means they will be jobless. I'm just looking at one of the dailies here. And it says the government to amend the 2009 investment uh, law. And one of the provisions here, it says all non-governmental organizations, private companies in general, banks, insurance companies, telecommunication companies, petroleum companies, hotels and lodges working in South Sudan are directed to notify all aliens working with them in all the positions to cease working as from the 15th mm. of October 2014. That means... If you're not South Sudanese, then by the uh, 15th of next month, then you'll be jobless. Now, that is something that uh, obviously uh, is worrying uh, many of the foreigners here. But mostly, it's uh, the NGOs. They say most of the trained uh, um, aid workers are foreigners. And they are worried about the more than 1.3 million South Sudanese who have been displaced uh, uh, by the conflict that uh, is going on in the country. And they're saying, what is the fate of these people? Because once this one month comes to an mm -hmm. end, then it means most aid agencies will not be operating in South Sudan. However, the government says, it's not all the jobs, but those jobs that can be done by South uh, Sudanese nationals. And everyone now is just watching to see how that plays out. Indeed, uh, Kofa, businesses from Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, China. They've all invested heavily in South Sudan over the years. A plan like this obviously will antagonize all of them at one go. Does Mr. Keir have a plan to manage the fallout from this decision? Well, we, we, we have been trying to get, uh, uh, to get uh, a government, official government reaction to that. Uh, but we have not been able to, to get hold of, uh, of government officials. Of course, there, there are those fears uh, that, uh, you know, probably because there are so many uh, Kenyans, uh, Ugandans, uh, and people, uh, you know, uh, uh, others from uh, Ethiopia, um, uh, Eritrea, working here in South Sudan. Of course, uh, people here are expecting that there might be some friction between, uh, you know, the regional uh, countries and the government of South Sudan. But of course, 
we will be uh, trying to seek official communication from uh, uh, government officials uh, uh, as this whole story uh, unfolds. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, CCTV's Kofan Brenja. He has been in Juba for a few days now. He'll certainly be there to keep tabs on the story as it develops. We're still in South Sudan for the moment. Ten months after a civil war started in December last year, businesses in the capital, Juba, are still very much in recovery mode. Investors say they've seen some improvement as some sense of fragile calm returns to the war-torn country. Kofan Brenja has more. Fun times in South Sudan's capital, Juba. Patrons can now sit back, relax and have a good time. A different picture though. Many fled the country during the conflict and businesses were literally crippled here. We would go for three, four, five days without any single customer. So business suffers a lot, suffered a lot that time. Um, everybody left and um, we did not know what the future was for, for Juba at that time. And uh, slowly, slowly things started picking up and uh, from uh, April things started coming back to normal. Uh, May still business struggling, but still uh, some few clients coming in. But June, July, and August, we have seen, I mean, a drastic uh, change. But now many businesses are slowly picking up. With some sense of calm, investor confidence has been growing in the last two months or so. We are very optimistic that uh, Juba is, I mean, going to be okay, and uh, we will get back to where we were last year. Um, December. Fun was limited here in Juba for the past few months. Businesses too had suffered huge losses during the crisis. But now with relative pace, life is slowly getting back to normal. Many here hope the situation remains the same, even as efforts to find a lasting solution to the conflict intensify. I want to answer Denise to love the Stay away from problems, no I want our people also to think that war cannot bring the world. They have seen tough times in the past nine months, but they are optimistic that the conflict will come to an end sooner rather than later. Kofam Renje, CCTV, Juba, South Sudan. Now, further north, Egypt has reached its target of $8.5 billion for the expansion of the Suez Canal. The central bank governor, Hisham Ramez, says the funds had been raised in just about eight days after banks issued investment certificates to finance the project. The Suez Canal project includes the upgrading the facility into an international industrial and logistics hub in order to attract more ship traffic and generate more income. Officials have said the new development was expected to boost annual revenues from the Suez Canal to over $13 billion a year by 2023 from the current figure of just $5 billion. Canal revenues are a vital source of hard currency for Egypt, which has suffered quite the slump in tourism and foreign investment ever since 2011. Over in East Africa, over 800 delegates are in Rwanda's capital for business-to-business -business meetings at the sidelines of the World Exports Development Forum. The Interaction Trade Center and Rwanda's government have both been working to promote more transactions between businesses at different ends of the value chain to grow exports, especially among sub-Saharan SMEs. The conference in Kigali aims to tackle the hard questions of bringing trade and private sector-led growth to landlocked countries and island nations, especially those considered least developed nations, and how to make them globally competitive. Export development is really about embracing competition. How do we ensure that we are prepared to put ourselves out there globally and swim with the best? How do we equip local entrepreneurs and businesses to take advantage of the many opportunities to get better and stronger, to overcome geographical and other disadvantages, we must benchmark ourselves against the best in the world, not just against the similar economies. Investing in women is not just fair or right, but actually makes sense, especially with statistics showing that women entrepreneurs tend to invest over 90% of earnings in social impact areas like nutrition, 
education and health, compared to just 40% for men. This means that the push to increase the focus on women-owned small and medium companies is seen as key to development. Yesterday, we launched together a special initiative to promote women entrepreneurs and SMEs in public procurement. After all, more than 90% of business operators in Africa, and indeed in Rwanda, are SMEs, and many of them female-owned. Rwanda understands the immense potential and the contribution of the SMEs to the economy. Currently, just over 1% of global procurement is dedicated to women, while half of the global population is female. Despite applying affirmative action, though, any growth will most likely be private sector-led. A vibrant private sector is the only way trade-led growth and development can be achieved. A vision that there should be a commitment to create employment opportunities, particularly for the youth, and to spur entrepreneurship among its citizens. Up to two-thirds of all former jobs in the global economy are made by SMEs, and this number goes up to 80% in low-income countries, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Majority of the entrepreneurs involved are mostly women, meaning that these are now a major engine for growth in the global economy. Peter Kaba, CCTV, at the World Export Development Forum in Kigali, in Rwanda. Now, just before we run into our first break, a quick run through the equity markets here for you. 52.17.25, the highest level the NSE 20 share index has been at so far this year. Uh, keep a very close eye on equity, of course, considering the developments and the evolution around its MVNO program. Quite a few bullish sentiments. Just, get, uh, just keep on getting stoked around that particular counter. Uh, over in South Africa, JSC, a bit of a pullback here, down, point, uh, down about four tenths in trading today, uh, ahead of tomorrow's meeting of the Fed. That, of course, will have a ripple effect on currency matters moving forward. We'll keep tabs on that and update you right here in Global Business. African food producers are angling for slice of the Russian pie as Russia seeks food supplies outside Europe. We'll also be looking at Ethiopia's changing skyline, looking at new tech that's not just change in the face of Addis Ababa, but also how the housing is arrived at as well. Africa is on the move. It's only seven of the world's ten fastest growing economy. We help you make sense of the fast changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is at. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business Africa from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Now, Russia is hosting its annual International Food Expo, and producers from Africa and around the world are in the Russian capital to showcase their produce. The expo comes amidst a sanctions war, if you will, between Russia and Western countries, which essentially means that a lot of the exhibitors planning to attend have essentially lost their business in Russia, at least if they are from the West. Some African producers, however, are looking to step in and fill the void. Jake Rashbash reports from the Russian capital. Following Western sanctions last month over Russia's alleged involvement in the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, Russia banned imports of fruits, vegetables, meat, fish and dairy products from the European Union and the United States. Moscow has called the import bans an opportunity for growers in Russia to fill domestic demand. But with decades of underinvestment in agriculture and the Russian winter approaching, Russians are having to look elsewhere for their produce. Russia thinks that sub-Saharan Africa with its southern hemisphere seasons and diverse produce could be a good place to start. At this year's Food Expo in Moscow, South Africa is playing a leading role, winning the annual award for Best Pavilion. As a fellow BRICS member state, South Africa is keen to get deeper into the Russian export market. This is an opportunity for us to also uh, expand and broaden the scope of our exports to the Russian market. And we think that uh, this environment is a perfect opportunity for us uh, to do that. But some African state representatives in Moscow are saying that there's more to be done for Russians to start importing African goods on a large scale. Russians don't know Africa that well. 
and there's need for more image projection of Africa in general and for the Russian market. Russian officials are saying that the prominence of South Africa at the Food Expo and the BRICS alliance between the two countries has implications for the region at large. We are ready to deliver our own products to Africa and to buy from there. Our focus now isn't on South Africa as the dominant country, but as a window into Africa. Through South Africa, we hope to get close with its neighbors. So as tension between Russia and the West grows, it looks like Africa may be about to cash in. Jake Rashvas, CCTV, Moscow. A Chinese real estate developer set up shop in Addis Ababa and is constructing the first and the largest urban complex in Ethiopia's capital. It's hoped that the project will inject fresh capital, fresh skills and ideas into the country's housing and construction sectors. Here's Penina Karibe with more. Launched eight months ago, the Chinese-owned Sehe real estate company has brought new housing construction technology in Ethiopia, with the first and biggest urban complex being built northeast of the capital, Addis Ababa. On Monday, the company opened Puli Lotus International Center, announcing the official launch of the first real estate project. This project, which is being undertaken and leveled as Puli Lotus International Center, is one of the most successful urban area developments to bring efficient building, construction technology and know-how, thereby facilitating the smooth transfer of construction technology to Ethiopia. The project covers an area of 30,000 square meters consisting of apartments, star-level hotels, offices, shopping centers, supermarkets, banks and different leisure facilities. The 12-story buildings are half-finished and are hoped to inject new housing technology in the fast developing East African nation. It will bring new concept and new experience to people's living for the residents of Addis Ababa. But this is only a beginning. I'm sure as a pilot project, there will be more projects like this, which will, I think, as the slogan says, create a center and you will change a city. Co-invested by the CGCOC group and a private Chinese investor, Xiao Qian, the over 3 billion Ethiopian beer project hires more than 500 Chinese and Ethiopian workers. For this project, I think uh, one is we want to bring some new concept to this country. And the second, I just want to give more job opportunity to local people. The new real estate hopes to improve the living standards of the locals. Penina Karibe, CCTV. Now, a little early in the bulletin, we of course did talk about the World Development World Export Development Forum. It's taking place in Kigali. The idea here is to boost growth, especially through small and medium-sized enterprises. They're usually the largest creator of jobs right across Africa, and most of them happen to be owned by women. Let's uh, dig a little deeper into that story. Francis Guitari is the CEO of the Rwandan Development Board. He joins us from the Rwandan capital of Kigali. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, some African governments have announced quota plans for government contracts with specific allocations for women, the youth, and so on. What results, if any, have these plans produced in terms of boosting the growth of SMEs? Hello. Uh, thank you for having me um, tonight. Uh, yesterday, we had the Women Vendors uh, Exhibition and Forum happening here on the sidelines of the 14th World Export Development Forum. And uh, women and all the participants in the forum agreed uh, to lobby various governments in the world to um, initiate um, a mechanism where uh, uh, women-owned uh, SMEs can be prioritized in the uh, global public procurement systems and this has been seen as uh, a quick win in the breakthrough towards getting many uh, female owned SMEs into the global value chain in the um, international trade system. Indeed. Um, access to credit and property rights have still been a problem for women in some African states for years now. Why is this still an issue at this point in time? We are after all in the 21st century. Well, uh, there are many structural challenges that continue to impede uh, women access to uh, resources, really, uh, financial resources, uh, property resources, 
and many other uh, facilitation resources that would help women uh, to prosper. And so today here in Kigali, Rwanda, we have been looking at uh, many of these obstacles and working together to devise mechanisms to resolve them. It is uh, indeed recognized uh, here that uh, over 90% of the businesses in Africa uh, continue to be small and medium enterprises, and majority of those are female-owned. So it's recognized that unless we can get women to access financing, uh, to access uh, facilitation for trade, uh, we cannot break through development challenges that the continent continues to face. Indeed, our final question to you, Mr. Gattari, is more intra-African trade, easier intra-African trade, the best way to bootstrap the development of SMEs by giving them access to wider markets using essentially the same standards instead of relying on quotas? Well, uh, intra-Africa trade continues to be uh, below acceptable standards. Only 11.5% of all trade that is happening on the continent is intra Africa trade. But this has also got to be understood in the wider context of Africa's share of global trade, which is below 4% today. And so what we have been uh, deliberating on here in Kigali has been on how to break through some of the uh, tariff-related and non-tariff-related barriers uh, that make it difficult for uh, cross-border trade. Now, uh, we have seen some of the emerging examples of best practices, particularly happening here in East Africa, where uh, countries of the Northern Corridor have really collaborated to remove tremendously uh, most of the non-tariff related barriers and jointly to invest in infrastructure uh, projects that would make it, uh, will eventually make it very easy uh, for businesses to trade across borders. And it's recognized that intra-Africa trade is very important even before people can talk about increasing global trade from Africa. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your time. That's Francis Gattari. He's the CEO of the Rwandan Development Board. He was talking to us live there from the Rwandese capital of Kigali. Let's move on to a quick run through commodity prices. Not much of a difference from some of the numbers we've been looking at for some of these commodities over the last couple of weeks. Uh, crude oil still well below $100 a barrel. With respect to oil, however, some interesting news coming out of Nigeria. Total has put up one of its blocks uh, in Nigeria up for sale. Uh, it's essentially a deep water oil field. It was looking to sell that off to Sinopec for about two and a half billion dollars. That deal, however, did fail. Now it's back on the block. When we return, we'll be talking to an entrepreneur who's reaping from his solutions to getting around Cairo's ridiculous traffic jams. All that and more is coming up next. Welcome back to the program. You're still watching Global Business Africa. Let's take you to Cairo. The city's economy by itself loses about $8 billion a year due to its traffic jams alone. Now, as the population grows, the situation is just going to get far worse. And so far, Egyptian authorities haven't developed proper strategies to reduce the frequency or the losses or the intensity of these traffic jams. However, not everyone's complaining. One entrepreneur has made it possible for travellers to get around the traffic at fairly little inconvenience and for a good return for himself. Yasser Hakim's conversation with the manager of Nile Taxis makes our grassroots segment tonight. Magid Kirolos is a young man who took advantage of the traffic frustrations and turned them into a successful business venture. Uh, we saw how, how much traffic we have in Egypt, in Cairo mainly. And, uh, and this highway is completely empty. So we decided why not to, uh, to remove our business from the sea and, and work uh, in the Nile on the transportation business to create a new uh, transportation methods to the Cairo uh, population. Sitting in his brand new 20-seater boat with Wi-Fi and sound system, Kirolo spoke of the bumpy ride he took since he started in February 2013. It's costing us uh, six years. Six years, for how, how, how much did it cost? We, 
We already launched boats, we, uh, we, we, we launched some uh, stations and all this to push our uh, governments because we have a lot of changes in, in, in the governments in Egypt to take action toward this, but a real action, not just liking the business or liking the, the, the idea, but to, to give us a license, to give us permission to work, a license for stations, license for boats. We opted to give it a try. I took the Nile taxi boat parked beside the CCTV building to reach my house. The same route I take by car every day. So we started our trip from the office to my home in Maadi. As you can see, it's empty, there's no traffic jam, the weather is beautiful, and you can even listen to some music on the way. We used the small boat for three people. Nile Taxi started with one boat last year, now they have six in different sizes. We make eight fixed trips daily, four in the morning and four in the evening, at only $7 per person. If you want a private ride at our own special time, you pay $25. Ahmed tells me most clients are bank or private sector employees, as the price is higher than normal taxis. We're nearly there, that's exactly where our route ends. It took us around 10 to 12 minutes just to arrive from the office to this end of the road close to my house. I usually do it by car in at least 45 minutes. There is only one other Nile taxi company. It's a 60-year-old state-owned company that uses worn-out, outdated buses that are not a comfortable ride anymore. Kirolos said he is not afraid of competition and is planning to expand. We dream of having every half an hour a, a boat on every station. That's our dream. And to, uh, to work with Na from Mahadi to, to, uh, to Shobra continuously without stop. That's my dream. A simple idea that Kirolos made a reality. Yes, Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. All right then, uh, benefit of running through an entire capital city because we've got one big massive river running right through it. Currency is now for you. Two stories we're keeping a very close eye in the Kenyan Chilean, of course, continuing to weaken despite fairly active liquidity mop-up operations by the central bank. The Rand, however, is our focus. It uh, posted the second day of gains today, but watch out for what happens tomorrow the Fed. If they signal the tightening of policy, that will definitely be Rand negative. Now, with regard to tomorrow's program, we'll be focusing on developments in Africa's youngest economy. And it's controversial, frankly, employment stance. The policies out of South Sudan will be in focus right here. We'll also, however, be looking at an innovator who's developing low-cost computers in Togo. All that and more is in the pipeline. Okay, on that, we'll have it for you ready in 23 hours. But that's it for this edition of the program. Send your feedback to Global Business Africa at cctv.com. Facebook and Twitter is another place you also do spend quite a bit of time on. So we'll see you over there. Thank you so much for watching tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Ramanyan.